Okay, so we're going to we're start recording. my third lecture. There's a question. Yes. Yes, and there is a question from uh, previous lectures. Do we know constructively why the algebraic closure of Q is the union of Galois extensions of Q? Yes. So that's a good question. Um, so why? Uh, right. So. Why is Q bar a union of finite Galois extensions? And so this actually touches on sort of one of the main reasons that Galois theory is so useful, even if you have a field extension that is not Galois, by using a construction like a splitting field, you can put it into a Galois extension, right? So if we have a finite extension of the rational numbers, we could always, for example, write it as Q adjoin Sorry about that. Uh, let me get rid of this margin. Q adjoin a single element. That's the primitive element theorem. Um, and then what you can do is you can just say, you know, look at it's a minimal polynomial. And then, um, you can let F twiddle be the splitting field. Of our polynomial. Over Q and so this will contain F that has one root, maybe more by accident. And whoops, sorry about that. Uh, how do I go? Ah, get out of here. Oh no, what's going on here? Ah, ah, what did I do? It seems you're in uh, some sort of zoom mode. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, uh, right. So th this extension is Galois because one of the descriptions, for example, is the splitting field of a separable polynomial. So for instance, if, if you know, if you took Q adjoin the cube root of two, well, it's called a Galois closure, although it has nothing to do with topology. You take Q adjoin the cube root of two and the cube root of unity. And so every finite extension can be enlarged to a finite Galois extension. And that's why the uh, algebraic numbers are a union of Galois extensions. So this happens all the time when you use Galois theory. You might generate a field that's not Galois over Q, but by passing to some splitting field, maybe for a couple of polynomials, you can put it into a Galois extension and then you can get to work and use the Galois group and hopefully answer your original question. So I know that the question I was asked had a term constructive in it. I don't know if that was in the sense of logic or it was just a, a loose use of the term. Did that answer the question? Why everything's a union of Galois, finite Galois extensions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So we talked last time about the topology. So the idea is that automorphisms are close if they're equal on a big degree finite extension. The bigger the degree, the closer they are, just like an analysis. Things are close if they're within epsilon, but you know, what's epsilon? It kind of depends. Maybe one tenth isn't small enough. You know, the, Smaller epsilon is the closer they are. It's all kind of qualitative and then you might pass to a limit. Okay, so we have our basic open sets, which are kind of like um, basic open sets, are kind of like translated balls. If we were in a metric space, we translate by a subgroup. And it's just all the stuff that looks the same on some finite extension, hopefully bigger, it makes the neighborhood smaller. And open sets are unions of these things. And this is a Hausdorff topology because if two automorphisms are different, then they can be distinguished on some elements and that element lives in a finite extension and therefore they're different on that finite extension. And so then you can cut out two disjoint cosets in which they lie. And those are two disjoint open sets. Um, and so at the end of last time, perhaps with some hesitation and difficulty, 
I discussed why if you go for the subgroup H to the fixed field LH to the subgroup that fixes it, you get back to the closure of H. Um, and so I updated the lecture note slides to hopefully explain that point with a little bit more uh, clarity than I had in the lecture. And so I, I believe this is, yeah, theorem, theorem 4.7 has this kind of stuff in it. And so in particular, uh, if the subgroup is closed, then from H to a field back to a fixed field, we get back H since closed H are equal to H bar. And so we get Kroll's theorem that you get a correspondence between all intermediate fields and closed subgroups. So last time we discussed the second part of that, that um, from the H to the LH to the Galois group of L fixing LH, you get back H. For the other case, from a field to the Galois subgroup to the fixed field of that getting back to the original field. So I'll just refer to the lecture notes. One of those containments is very simple, just like in finite Galois theory, and the hard bit is to get the other containment. And I'll just say that the proof of both of these aspects of the infinite Galois correspondence do use, at least in the proof that I present in my lecture notes, do use finite Galois theory. So we're not really reproving finite Galois theory as a special case, although it can appear that way because all the statements specialize to known parts of finite Galois theory, but we do use the Galois correspondence for finite extensions as part of the proof details. And you can look in the lecture notes on that. So let's talk about some of the consequences of the Galois correspondence for a, an arbitrary, possibly infinite finite extension. So we have our, our Galois extension L over K and an intermediate field E. So all subgroups look like the group of automorphisms fixing a field, um, and they're all closed. And to make it open, it turns out that what you need is you need that corresponding field to be a finite extension. So openness of the subgroup, closeness of the subgroup corresponds to all fields, and openness corresponds to finite extensions um, of K, or equivalently, the, uh, the corresponding subgroup has finite index. In the whole Galois group, so this is very different from the ordinary topology in Euclidean space where openness and closeness. Well, it's not just that, of course, they're always complementary properties on a set and a subset, but you don't ever have them happening together. Um, well, I mean, you could like the non zero real numbers. Inside there, the positive reals inside the non zero reals is both open and closed. But when things are connected, it's classical topology, uh, manifolds, and so forth that are connected, you don't have simultaneous open and closed subsets except for the empty set in the whole space. So here we have all open subgroups are in fact closed, they're closed of a special type. Um, a subgroup is uh, that's closed is open exactly when it has finite index in the whole group. And um, the conjugation is related on a subgroup is related to the passing to a isomorphic field sigma E, like in the equation in red there. And so this doesn't involve any special, anything about topology, it's just pure algebra. You just kind of grind it out. Each side is contained in the other side. And so if your subgroup Galois L over E were normal, that would make the right side unchanged for all sigma, which by the Galois correspondence would make sigma E unchanged for all sigma, which would make E Galois. So the closed normal subgroups correspond to the intermediate E that are Galois over K and the open normal subgroup. So open is a special case of closed. Open means closed with finite index. The open normal subgroups correspond to the finite Galois extension. So openness is very closely related to finiteness on the field side. Now, someone had asked the question last time, if all the normal subgroups of the Galois group of L over K correspond to Galois extensions, and I believe that I had said, no, no, it's just the closed normal subgroups because the Galois correspondence is only between the 
closed subgroups in all fields. So if you look at closed normal subgroups, um, then you get a correspondence with the Galois extensions. But in fact, you could take any subgroup and look at, you could take any subgroup H and look at its fixed field. H could be normal. You could take a, an arbitrary normal subgroup and look at its fixed field. Okay, you don't have to start with a closed subgroup. Um, and so you can say, well, what if H were normal? So what if I took a normal subgroup? And I looked at its fixed field. Is that a Galois extension? So it turns out that when you take the closure of a subgroup, you don't change the fixed field. Again, there's no topology on the field. I'm not extending the automorphisms by continuity on the field or anything like that. Abstract field isomorphisms with the field with itself and uh, abstract field elements. We're not cutting anything out. We're just putting a topology onto the Galois group. Um, so it turns out, well, the fixed field is the same as the fixed field of the closure. And you can check, I have an appendix in the lecture notes um, that I put in about topological groups. It's just a general property that if you have a normal subgroup of a topological group, its closure is also a normal subgroup. So by topological group, I just mean a, a group with a topology where the group law and inversion are continuous. And so the real numbers are a topological group, Galois groups are topological groups. And when you pass to the closure, a normal subgroup stays normal. And so in fact, Therefore, it's true that LN over K is, in fact, a Galois extension because closed normal subgroups correspond to Galois extensions, and that's the fixed field of N bar is the same as the fixed field of N. So whoever asked that question, it is true that every normal subgroup is fixed field will be a Galois extension, but to have a correspondence one-to-one -one in both directions, we usually focus on just the closed case, but you could ask about the normal case and without being closed and, and the, you have your nice answer there. Okay. So, um, everything I've discussed involving the Krull topology, I define it directly on the Galois group. So you can see that you can just work with the group. You have these cosets coming from finite Galois extensions or even finite extensions. You get basic open sets, open sets, Complements or closed sets, you get your topology and all that stuff. Um, but there's actually, and this is often how it's introduced, there's a more, I would say, direct or indirect, depending on your point of view, another way of describing the topology, which is by putting the Galois group into a product of finite groups and then taking more advantage of what we know about product spaces. So, Whenever we make a field inside our extension bigger, so maybe there's L, F prime, F, and K, as we make the field bigger, perhaps it's still fun an extension, you're, the, fixed, the automorphisms fixing it is cut down, usually, and so you pass to a smaller basic open set around the identity. Um, and then you can translate it around to get basic opens around other automorphisms. And so by passing to a finite Galois extension, that was a very good question at the start of the lecture because I'm using that fact right here. Every finite extension can be inside of L can be enlarged to a finite Galois extension, essentially by taking the splitting field of a polynomial of an element that generates F over K. And the fact that L overhead is Galois is what um, makes, is what guarantees that we get a Galois extension of F inside of L that's still finite. And so by shrinking the neighborhoods, you could focus all of your attention on just the uh, subgroups that are correspond to fixed uh, subgroups fixing finite Galois extensions. But then instead of looking at the Galois group of L over F, I could look at the Galois group of F over K. Right? So if we look at F that's Galois, then you can talk about restricting the domain of an element in L over K, so maybe here's your sigma acting on L. And 
if you had a Galois extension, then you can restrict it to that. So here I'm writing F in the um, highlight for a Galois extension, you can restrict to that. In fact, everything, because every number, this is an algebraic extension, everything in L lives in a finite extension. And so therefore, and therefore in a finite Galois extension. And so if you know how your automorphism behaves on all finite Galois extensions of K inside L, you know it everywhere because the whole field is a union of finite Galois extensions of K inside L. And so therefore we could embed the whole Galois group into the product of the Galois groups of all the finite extensions of K inside L by sending every sigma to the tuple very big tuple of all of its restrictions to the different finite extensions that are Galois over K inside L. And so what we have here is we have a product of finite groups. So these are all finite groups. Okay. Um, whoops. And so um, this is an embedding because if, if you know how something looks on every F, you know how it looks everywhere because L is a union of the Fs. And so we have this embedding. Now on the right side, what we have is a product, typically infinite product of finite groups. And so of course we could, you know, it's very easy to uh, define, we all know how to multiply in a product group. Oops, sorry about that. Because the F's are Galois, just do component wise multiplication. And um, for the topology, we can make each of these discrete because there is no natural other topology on, um, on a finite set. Make each of these discrete and then give the product of everything, the product topology, which is definitely not discrete if you have an infinite number, if L is of infinite degree over K, there are infinitely many uh, Fs. And so like think about the countable direct product of plus or minus one. So this product on the right side, it's just a total direct product, all stuff. Um, I'm not just looking at the image, of the left side and the right side. If you look at the product of everything, no connection between the different components. And um, so that's a pretty big space, but you see by giving everything the discrete topology and the component, and then giving a product topology by Tikhonov's theorem, that makes the product of everything compact because, well, any topology on a finite set is compact. Um, and the product of compact spaces is compact. And so we've embedded our Galois group into a compact group. And so it turns out with some work, a little bit subtle on the topology side, that the image of the Galois group of L over K in the product of the Galois groups of all the finite Galois extensions of, of K inside of L, that image is in fact a closed subgroup and its topology inside the direct product, giving that the product topology and therefore giving every subset the subspace topology, the image of the Galois group of L over K inside that product, in fact, is it's closed. And the topology agrees, it's a homeomorphism of the left side with its image. So whenever you have an embedding of a topological space into another topological space, even if it's continuous and one-to-one, -one, you might say, oh, I have a homeomorphism with the, with the image. No, maybe not, because the topology of the bigger space you're embedding it in might not um, induce the subspace topology that agrees with the topology in the original space. But here it turns out that the topology on the Krull topology on the left side and the subspace topology on the image from the product topology on the right side actually line up and you get a homeomorphism of the left side with its image on the right side. What is the image on the right side? The image, what elements, what tuples, you know, if I gave you a G, whoa, if I gave you 
some random element in the product of all of these finite groups, it's a set of restrictions exactly when what? Well, you see, one constraint we need is if you have a tuple that's a whole bunch of restrictions from an automorphism, then if you had an F and an F prime, they have an intersection. And you better make sure, of course, if you have something that's being restricted to everything, it's restriction to F that's later restricted to F intersect F prime has to match the restriction to F prime that's also restricted to F intersect F prime. And so we get a necessary constraint, namely that the component of this tuple in F, it's an element in the Galag of F over K, if you restrict it to F intersect F prime, has to equal the component in F prime restricted to F intersect F prime for all finite Galois F and F prime inside of L. And so you have this kind of compatibility restriction. This is an abstract or generalization of what I was mentioning before with the five power cyclotomic extensions where every term has to match the previous, has to reduce to the previous term because of how I lined up the cyclotomic fields. And so here we're using all the finite Galois extensions. So we have this massive compatibility condition. And it turns out it's not so surprising that if you all these compatibilities match up, then you can define an automorphism of L that restricts in this way. It's sort of like saying, if you have a function defined on an open covering of a space, and on every pair of overlaps, the functions you've defined on those open sets agree, it's sort of obvious that you can then define a function on the whole space by just defining its value at a point as the value of, from any open set containing it, the value of the function that's attached to that open set, and the overlap compatibility means your, your definition is well-defined. So it's not really that surprising that this compatibility cuts out the image. Because there is, of the, a, there is a comment, Keith. Yes. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, this reminds me of sheaf axioms. Are there any connections? Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, there's sort of lots of places in math where you have, you're trying to define things that, that match on the overlaps. So you could say, you know, things like this, I mean, if you're going to define, you know, like in, I don't know, like Galois cohomology, um, then, you know, certainly things like this certainly show up. So that, that anytime you have, yeah, sure. Um, I don't, I don't think I have time right now to sort of say anything further on that, but it's, yeah, I mean, these, these things are certainly connected in, in a certain sense. Um, because of this compatibility, if something is not in the image, then there's a whole neighborhood of it in the product that's not in the image. So you might say that, you know, sort of, if, if you have two finite extensions, you have a tuple that doesn't match up. Where those things don't match up, then you look at All the uh, all tuples with the same components The intersection of finite Galois extensions is also a finite Galois extension. And so if you look at all the elements that have those same three components as G does, then this thing is not in the image either. So the complement The image, in fact, is open because 
if you look at uh, you look at all the tuples that have these three terms, and then at everything else, this sort of random stuff, this isn't open for the product topology. Because our components were discrete spaces. And so everything that's outside the image, there's a whole neighborhood of it outside the image. And so the complement of the image is open in the product topology and therefore the image is closed. Okay. And well, of course, in topology, closed inside of compact implies compact. And so therefore, This Galois group is compact for the Krull topology. Okay, and so this basic, I, I'm not actually aware of any other proof that the Krull topology is compact. A direct argument on the Galois group, I, I don't think I've ever seen it. Uh, maybe in specific examples you could, but kind of in this generality, this embedding into a product of finite groups and the identification of the Krull topology with the subspace topology and the product topology on the right side is what gives us the compactness. And so, in fact, quite often you'll see that the topology will just be defined directly by embedding into that product group and taking the subspace topology from the product topology. And so you can develop the infinite Galois theory more rapidly that way um, without doing a direct definition in the way I, I've done it. But I wanted to do it that way so you could see you could you can develop this stuff to a certain extent directly on the group. But ultimately, this viewpoint of the Galois group embedded in a product of finite groups is really helpful. It's the only known way, for example, I'm aware of to show that the topology on the Galois group is, in fact, uh, compact. OK, so. Um, ah, so maybe I got ahead of myself here, right? Okay. OK, so yeah, so. This is, in fact, how one often does, you can see in books, often one defines the topology by this embedding. Of course, you might argue that, well, this is not intrinsic to the Galois group. So by having shown you how to define the topology on the Galois group directly, this matching of the topology shows you that the topology of this embedding on the Galois group is, is, is an intrinsic thing, since the Krull topology is itself a kind of intrinsic thing. So, for example, by sticking an infinite Galois group into this kind of a product of finite groups, it can explain things that I had done earlier by arguing directly with Galois groups and their subgroups. So, for example, the Hausdorff property. Well, you see, each of these little finite groups is Hausdorff and is totally disconnected. Totally disconnected, Liang mentioned that in his course, it, it means that the only connected subsets are points. So you're not going to have interesting paths in the classical sense in a totally disconnected space. The only continuous functions from an interval 0, 1 into a totally disconnected space is, is constant. So each of the components in the product group is Hausdorff and totally disconnected. And well, if you, know, if you have a, a whole family of topological spaces, if these are all Hausdorff, there's the fact of general topology that the product of the spaces is Hausdorff. Or if you have a bunch of topological spaces, and these are all uh, totally disconnected, woo! It's not hard to show the product of all those spaces is totally disconnected. And of course, a subset of a Hausdorff or totally disconnected space still is Hausdorff or totally disconnected. And so if you were to define the topology on the Galois group 
by taking the topology it inherits as an embedded subset of this product of finite groups, then you immediately get the, that this, uh, the Galois group has a Hausdorff, topo the topology is Hausdorff, and totally discrete, and of course compact, as I already explained earlier. Um, and even the discreteness comes for free, because if the, the extension is finite, then this product is a finite product of discrete spaces, and a finite product of discrete spaces is discrete. Every subset of a discrete space is discrete, and so your Galois group is discrete. This might feel like a, a cheaper proof that the topology is discrete, but in any case, um, yeah, so you can see some things a lot more from, a, from the viewpoint of general properties of product spaces and topology or topological groups without having to um, directly argue with cosets of subgroups of Galois groups, the kind of general theorems about uh, topological groups give you a whole bunch of properties. So let's, uh, let's see how some more familiar groups may or may not appear as Galois groups. So for example, could you have the integers as a Galois group? And when I ask the question, I have in mind either as a topological group or maybe just its underlying algebraic structure. Could there be an infinite Galois group that at least without the topology looks like one of these groups? So what about the integers? So the story there, that's no, and that's because um, infinite, one reason is that infinite uh, compact house door spaces are uncountable. Okay, and so if you have an infinite group, this can be a Galois group, it had better be uncountable. Real numbers, no. Now you might say, well, one reason is R is not compact, but you still might ask, you might say, well, okay, but maybe there's some wild wacky topology on the real numbers that would make it a compact group and would let us realize some uh, Galois group has the group structure of the real numbers. So another reason is that that's causing a problem is that R is, R has, um, say this. Oops. R has no finite quotient groups. Besides zero. Okay, but an infinite Galois group will have an enormous number of finite quotient groups. Uh, maybe the, the term here I'd say R is a divisible group. If you know what a divisible abelian group is. Okay, it's sort of another way to describe the source of the problem. And the unit circle, you might say, well, hey, it's compact, so that's good, it's uncountable. But again, there's a problem. And again, the problem is uh, S1, its group structure is incompatible with being a Galois group. S1 is a divisible group. Divisible means Basically, everything is an nth power. Everything in the n, multiplying by n or adding or raising to the nth power, depending if it's additive or multiplicative, is surjective. And, and you, such a group cannot be cannot be an infinite Galois group. Okay, so none of these examples really worked. That's unfortunate. Um, so Galois groups really provide a completely different type of uh, topological group, not like the classical groups studied in real and complex analysis, um, orthogonal groups and things like that. So the special feature of infinite Galois groups is that they have an enormous number of finite quotients. Okay, the whole idea is from the Galois group of L over K, there's an intermediate finite extension So there's a lot of finite Galois extensions inside. And if you restrict to that subfield by Zorn's lemma, you're going to hit everything. Every automorphism at a finite level does go all the way up to the top in a huge number of ways if you accept Zorn's lemma. If you don't accept Zorn's lemma, um, you should probably find another area of mathematics to study. So um, anyway, uh, another way of putting it, the fact that you have all these finite quotients, if you look at it from the viewpoint of the Galois groups of L over F, is that they provide a basis of open 
subgroups or open normal subgroups if you restrict to uh, Galois, Galois F, um, Galois group of L over F, if F is Galois over K, that's an open normal subgroup. And so it's very different from, for example, the real line. Okay, if I took the real line here, and there's my copy of the real line, all of my years of artistic study have paid off here. Um, so if you put an interval around zero, you're not going to have any subgroups other than zero. And so this is typical. The unit circle is itself a group. But if you took a little arc around one on the unit circle, you're not going to it's not going to have any subgroups besides the trivial subgroup. And so this is typical for kind of the classical like Lie groups or things like that. The neighborhood of the identity has no subgroups besides a small enough neighborhood, no subgroups besides the trivial one. Infinite Galois groups are totally different. There's a whole basis of neighborhoods of the identity shrinking down to the identity consisting entirely of open subgroups. And so these infinite Galois groups are compact, they're Hausdorff, they're totally disconnected, and these abstract topological properties more or less characterize the kinds of groups that infinite Galois groups are. So groups with these three properties it include all finite groups, it's kind of boring, but also the piadic integers and infinite Galois groups. So these are called profinite groups. The term is a kind of a, an amalgamation of the, uh, oops, of the terms projective limit of finite groups. Um, so this term was introduced by Sayre, and if if your group is basically what that means is go back and look at this embedding of my Galois group into that product and look at those finite groups on the right hand side. Um, that's kind of a projective limit in some sense. The compatibility conditions that identify the image make it a well, the projective limit of the finite parts in that product. And so if all the pieces are cyclic groups, you talk about a pro-cyclic group. If all the pieces are P groups, you talk about a pro-P group. And so, of course, you can Google profinite groups. There have been whole books written on this subject. Um, the big motivation historically was from the source as infinite Galois groups. Okay? And it turns out that not only is every infinite Galois group or every Galois group, the finite case is kind of silly and easy, every Galois group of a field extension is a profinite group with its topology, but there's a converse theorem. Every profinite group can be interpreted as the Galois group of some Galois extension, not, whoops, not of Q, but just of some Galois extension. So I should emphasize no control over the base field. Okay, this is similar to the theorem that some of you may have seen that every finite group is a Galois group of some Galois extension. You don't really have much control over the base field. There's something called the inverse Galois problem that predicts all finite groups are Galois groups over Q. But in any event, if you don't pay attention to the base field, allow that to vary. All profinite groups are Galois groups. Okay, so this is exactly the kind of topological group that we're facing here when we're dealing with an infinite Galois extension. Are there any questions? Maybe I should stop and check on that. I haven't heard from Alvaro in a while. It looks good. I, I don't see any questions. Okay. I'll let you know if anything happens. Okay, fine. I was just wondering if I was talking to nobody right there, if we get cut off, but okay, fine. Um, all right, so so let's, let's try to put some of this stuff to work. Let's see if we can make the five attic integers into a Galois group over Q. So how would that work? So I had mentioned, I believe in the first lecture, that so remember the, 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 the so the five attic integers from Liang's lecture. So you could think about this as well, you could think about it as a sequence of numbers mod five and twenty five and one twenty five. Whoops. Keith? Yes? yes. There is a question. Yes. Yes. Is the profinite analog of the inverse Galois problem over Q open known to be negative? Um, is it open or is it closed? That's an interesting topological question. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so in fact, um, so 
actually, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't going to mention this, but since the question came up, that's a good question. Uh, so, in fact, it is not true, and it's merely because of cardinality reasons. So here, let me create a new page here. Okay. So, right. So, so let let me. Right. So we have the inverse Galois problem, which asks. Is every finite group a Galois group over Q, not over random stuff, but specifically over Q? Or in other words, remember with Galois theory, things get flipped around. Is it a quotient group of the Galois group? Of Q bar over Q. Okay, either way, uh, yeah, so we'd like to find is every finite group G a Galois group over Q? Um, and so, of course, we, we, the consensus, I believe, is yes, but this is still open, open problem. But um, for profinite groups, the question is closed. Ha, ha, ha. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, for profinite pro groups, the answer is no, and that's because of cardinality reasons, right? The, the cardinality of the Galois group of Q bar over Q. You know, you can you can take arbitrary products of profinite groups over arbitrary index sets and they're still profinite groups. Whoops. And so just for cardinality reasons, um, some profinite groups are just too big to be quotient to the Galois group of Q bar over Q. It still would be an interesting question. Could you characterize which Profinite groups um, should be or are expected to be um, quotient groups of the Galois group of Q bar over Q. Well, off the top of my head, I actually don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if there's a proposal for what that should be. Alvaro, have you heard of that? No, I don't. I don't think I have. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask a question. Is there a, is there a good conjecture here? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, there are there are conjectures of Shafarevich about um, certain profinite groups um, between Q bar and the abelian uh, maximal abelian extension of Q. But I'm not. Yeah, I don't know what the. Hmm. I guess one should just Google uh, inverse Galois problem and put the word profinite in quotes, and you can see what comes up. Okay. Um, so actually, I see that I'm at 446. So, okay, so let's, let me indicate, how could you make the five attic integers into a Galois group over Q? So, I had mentioned earlier that if you take Q and you, um, whoops, And you go up to say the 25 cyclotomic field. So that Galois group is the Unis mod 25 up here as the identity, the usual Galois correspondence. And, um, and so then here you get the numbers mod 25 that have to fix the fifth roots of unity. So that's a kind of one mod five. Um, and so that gives you flexibility. It's one plus five times anything. And so there's five of those and four of these, five of those and four of these. Um, and so I'd like to flip this around. And so Liang had mentioned that um, there are these five attic Teichmuller, Teichmuller numbers, Teichmuller representatives, things who say in the case of five whose fourth power is one. 
So I'm going to write this as uh, you can split this into a group of fourth roots of unity, things of order four, and um, the group generated by one plus five. Okay, Liang had mentioned one plus p, for example. And so if instead you were to work with that, with that subgroup, so if you were to take instead the uh, subgroup of elements, and so this is generated at the level of 25, looking on my computer, it's generated by uh, 7. Okay, so if you take the subgroup generated by 7 mod 25, 7 has order 4, 7 squared, for example, is minus 1 mod 25. That that has order four and it has index five. And so that gives you a field which has degree five and there's a cyclic extension of degree five. And so let's uh, let's continue this train of thought. And so what we'll do now more generally is if we take Q and we go up to the five to the n plus one th roots of unity, then that Galois group, maybe I'll put it over here and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. So this Galois group, this turns out to be a product of a group of order four and the group generated by one plus five. And so this has size four, this has size five to the n. That's why I picked five to the n plus one. And so if you take the subgroup fixed by the elements of order four, this is going to give you a degree five to the n extension where the Galois group of uh, this extension is uh, cyclic. Of order five to the n, and so it turns out that oops. so if you took the union, these are all contained in each other. You get a a Galois extension of Q, and its Galois group. Q is called, uh, yeah, it's, it's isomorphic to the five attic numbers. Um, and so in general, so this is called the, uh, the cyclotomic Z5 extension of Q. So it's not the five power cyclotomic fields, but it's called a family of subfields that kind of have codimension four at every layer. And those together give you an extension of Q with Galois group Z5. You can do this with all other primes, even the prime two being a little bit more careful with the Teichmuller stuff. Um, and so, yeah, and so this is how you can construct the piatic integers, the additive group of piatic integers as, um, as a Galois group of a Q. And this is a good place to stop. And so we'll start next time saying a few more things about these kinds of extensions and then discuss some more number theoretic directions and not just pure Galois theory. That's it.